What was Tenpenny's plan exactly? What problems occurred in implementing this plan? What was the role of Emmett, whose place was visited by the infamous Green Saber? Or who were the ballers who drove into Grove Street and shot CJ's family home, leading to the death of Beverly Johnson? These are just a few of the many question marks that appear in our heads after watching the introduction. But even more questions arise when we learn from the storyline that Big Smoke and Tenpenny are connected to the car that was used to assassinate Sweet, resulting in Beverly's death. And then there are again even more questions right after it is revealed that Big Smoke is working with Tenpenny and the Ballers. In addition to all this, there are also some events from the beginning of the game. Tenpenny's strange tricks and the very confusing thread of the Loco Syndicate and Mike Torino. Not to mention Emmett, who once had the green saber in his backyard, and who is perceived by the players as the good character, being on the same team with the boys from Grove Street. There's so much to discuss that in the end, it's hard to put it all together conveniently. But more importantly, there is also the issue of the fact that the gaming community is constantly digging into this topic, which means that new juicy discoveries are found from time to time. So today, let's try to take a closer look at this topic once again, mainly to answer the most bothering questions and generally to put everything we know into one relatively organized whole. Enjoy! First, let's try to figure out what Frank Tenpenny's plan was. For this purpose, it is worth outlining the circumstances that were in Los Santos sometime before the events of the story that we learn about in San Andreas. As we know from the plot, Grove Street Families has lost a large part of its territory to Ballers and Vagos since CJ left Los Santos in 1987. This was due to a new, highly addictive substance that appeared on the black market at that time, crack. This drug guaranteed street gangs such as Ballers a very generous income. The money, in turn, allowed such a gang to be better armed. Thanks to having more weapons, it was possible to gain an advantage in gang wars and so on. What is most important is that the gangs competing with the Ballers were falling behind. Therefore, it became logical that in order not to be wiped out by the Ballers, you also have to start selling crack. However, Grove Street families, mainly due to the leader himself, Sweet, did not join the gangs selling this drug. This was primarily due to the tradition of this organization, which prohibited selling hard drugs, let alone using them. In this case, being faithful to traditions quickly led to the increasing advantage of the rival gangs. Despite the deepening crisis, which brought Sweet's gang closer to collapse every day, he still stubbornly stood his ground. All this was closely observed by a cunning officer of Crash, a corrupt unit aimed at reducing the level of crime in the city when it comes to street gangs. Frank Tenpenny, however, saw it as a business opportunity for himself. Namely, in San Fierro, thanks to the activities of Mike Torino, a group called Loco Syndicate was formed, an organization which had the goal of selling crack on a full scale. It was here that Tenpenny saw an opportunity to make good money. The policemen planned to buy huge amounts of crack cocaine from the Loco Syndicate, which would then be distributed by the two largest gangs in the city, the Ballers and Families. Being a member of Crash, a unit fighting gangs in Los Santos, Tenpenny had good knowledge of the hood, and also had a considerable influence on the functioning of the gangs. Tenpenny probably had leverage over many high-ranking members of all these gangs, which additionally ensured his safety. Therefore, he had the chance to engage two powerful factions in an operation that would bring in millions of dollars. Even though the families themselves were somewhat weak at the time, and the situation wasn't better with a civil war of sorts, Tenpenny knew that if the gang united and sorted out the differences between the sets, they would pose a major threat. It would be nice to have this gang on friendly terms. However, since families did not want to join this whole drug operation, Tenpenny had to come up with something. And so he decided to bribe Big Smoke, who put money above everyone else and was one of the highest ranking members of GSF. In exchange for help in carrying out Tenpenny's plan, Smoke is to become one of the main faces of the crack operation and earn a lot of money. Big Smoke's main task at the very beginning is to murder Sweet to take command of the gang and introduce the members to the crack trade. Smoke also manages to recruit another high-ranking member of the families, Ryder. However, it is difficult to say whether this move was suggested by Crash members or whether it was simply Smoke's initiative. This raises a question, 
Does this mean that Smoke and Ryder were both behind organizing the attack on Sweet, which ultimately resulted in the death of Beverly Johnson? In my opinion, the answer is yes, but only in the case of Big Smoke. Big Smoke tried many times to convince Sweet to reconsider the reasoning and allow the gang to enter the crack trade. This, in turn, was contrary to what Crash had ordered Smoke to do. We can therefore conclude that Smoke most likely wanted to avoid killing Sweet. In theory, if Sweet agreed to get into crack, he would no longer be an obstacle, and therefore, he would not be a problem to anyone. Smoke thought he could kill two birds with one stone, make a lot of money, and save his friend. No wonder, after all, the gentlemen had known each other since childhood. For old time's sake, even for a materialist like Smoke, killing Sweet was just a very hard step. In Smoke's phone conversation with Tenpenny, you can see the same thing. Smoke didn't want Sweet to die directly at his hands, explaining that he couldn't do it. However, Tenpenny then made it clear that he didn't care, and Sweet was supposed to be dead by the end of the week. In my opinion, it is not without reason that right after this scene, we get the first cutscene with Green Saber. It seems like Smoke, either himself or through Crash, organized the Ballers to kill the leader of Grove Street families. The man tipped off the Ballers about exactly when Sweet would be on Grove Street and left the rest to the Ballers. After all, the Ballers were aware of Smoke's involvement in Tenpenny's operation. This is demonstrated by the second cutscene in the introduction, in which we see three Baller OGs discussing whether working with Smoke is a good idea. Anyway, I think Smoke delegated the Ballers to this job, because his conscience at that moment did not allow him to get rid of his old friend with whom he had been through so much. And while I believe that yes, Smoke was involved in all this action, I have serious doubts as to whether the same can be said about Ryder. The events of the game suggest that Ryder did not take any specific actions for Smoke and Tenpenny until the Green Saber mission. Still, some people highlight that we witness Tenpenny coming to Ryder in one of his missions, which is similar to the moments when we see Tenpenny coming to Big Smoke. However, this situation does not really confirm anything. The officer's visit to Ryder has the same form as the visit to Sweet, which we learn about in the Lost Sepulchros mission. Peek this. Tenpenny just came by, so that one of them ballers that you and Smoke laid out, Lil Weasel, is getting buried and all the OGs gonna be there. But this is just a curiosity brought up to deny that Tenpenny's visit to Ryder's house had any hidden meaning. Tenpenny wanted to help the families maintain the balance of power in the city, just like when he tipped Sweet off that there would soon be a favorable situation to take out one of the Baller OGs. Once again, we are talking about the Lost Sepulchros mission. So to sum up this part of the video, it looks like Ryder didn't know much and didn't mean much in all of this. However, this is most likely due to Ryder having never intended to be a traitor from the game's developmental point of view. He became the traitor very unexpectedly when Rockstar stopped getting along with Ryder's voice actor. Then Rockstar quickly, without paying attention to details, killed Ryder in the Pier 69 mission, and also threw him into both the The Green Saber mission and the Photo Opportunity mission to make it all look like this, that he had betrayed his friends and had been conspiring against them for some time. This is why Ryder has the most inconsistencies when it comes to the storyline related to Green Saber. Coming back strictly to Tenpenny's plan, the rest of it is a bit unclear. The attempt on Sweet's life failed. In fact, it was the beginning of the great failure of the officer's operation. After all, Sweet's mother died in the attack, and thus CJ had a reason to return to Los Santos after a long time. What we do know is that this plan has undergone some necessary adjustments. First of all, subsequent attempts to murder Sweet were suspended for some time, probably because of CJ. Well, Crash thought that before they tried to kill Sweet yet again, they could use CJ for dirty work. Killing Sweet back then would make no sense. The second, more interesting reason could be that at the time CJ's mother died, Tenpenny's competition showed up. If we look at the missions for Big Smoke or Crash during Los Santos, we will quickly notice that we mainly harm two gangs, the Russians and Los Santos Vagos. It seems as if these two organizations were also seeking to make a deal with the Loco Syndicate, as best exemplified by the Wrong Side of the Tracks mission. During this task, some Vagos were going to meet members of the San Fierro Rifa, which, as we know, was producing crack for the Loco Syndicate. Even their leader, T-Bone Mendez, was one of the Syndicate's most important people. 
We also know that the Loco Syndicate wasn't able to sell a large amount of drugs before the storyline. This is somewhat related to one of the cutscenes from the introduction, where Torino talks about this issue with T-Bone Mendez. As you can see, competition for Tenpenny could mean that his lackeys would receive less amount of drugs to sell, and therefore the profit would not be as high as it could be if there was no competition. As a consequence, considering that there were other problems and CJ came to LS to solve these problems, the killing of Sweet could be postponed. And that brings us to the Green Saber mission. It seems that Tenpenny has realized that everything is ready. It's high time to make another attempt to kill Sweet. That is because Sweet organizes his men to attack the ballers, and it is supposed to take place under Mulholland intersection, which is far from Grove Street, ironically creating a perfect opportunity to get rid of him. What remains a mystery is what the Green Saber was doing in this mission. In one of the cutscenes, it appears as if Big Smoke, Ryder, the Ballers, and Crash are preparing the car for another attempt. CJ immediately thinks the same thing and rushes to the meeting place, knowing that this is another ambush for his brother. I gotta go tell Sweet about... Oh, fuck! Sweet! Look, go get Kendall and take her to a safe place. What you thinking? It's Sweet. I think him and the homies is walking into a trap. Just go. Go! However, there is no sign of Green Saber on the spot. The only theory that makes any sense is that CJ arrived too late and that Green Saber attacked Sweet a few moments earlier. According to this theory, this is why Sweet was injured. However, there is no confirmation here. There is neither cutscene nor dialogue from Sweet about Green Saber. In conclusion, it is difficult to support this theory without any arguments. Now that we have finished the main thread regarding Green Saber, we will move on to issues that are very close to this topic. In the beginning, the story of Emmett, the guy to whom CJ went with Big Smoke in the mission The Nines and AKs to reach an agreement on helping Grove Street families in terms of weaponry. In my opinion, this thread was presented in the introduction in a slightly incorrect way. But let's start from the beginning. During one of the cutscenes in the introduction, we see the Green Saber leaving Emmett's place. The developers probably wanted to show us that the Ballers obtained their weapons from Emmett. I will also add that this does not mean that Emmett is an evil character, because he did not even have to know what the weapon would be obtained for. Similarly, 8-Ball prepared a bomb that was placed in Cheetah, which was a car trap set for Claude. If we were to blame Emmett for something, it would rather be the ethical issues here, considering what gang in the city he had relations with. However, what is most important is that the Ballers shot the Johnson's house using micro SMGs, which Emmett allegedly did not have. This was mentioned in the game's storyline when the Grove Street Families Board was discussing the lack of appropriate weapons. When CJ asked if Emmett could help, it quickly turned out that he only had the most basic guns. If Emmett had any arrangements that would allow him to get such powerful guns for the Ballers, he would probably use this source to get decent equipment for the families as well. As for the question of whom exactly the Ballers and the Green Saber were, unfortunately, little has been established in this regard. In my opinion, the closest to the truth is LS Central, a YouTuber who once mentioned that it was Little Weasel who was one of these Ballers. In case you don't remember who is Little Weasel, he's the guy CJ kills in the Doberman mission. This makes sense because first, Little Weasel has a character model of one of the Ballers who took part in the attack on Grove Street. Moreover, his lines of dialogue also suggest this. Buster Crash set me up! Furthermore, Little Weasel was probably also one of the Baller OGs, which we can judge from the fact that many important figures showed up at his funeral in the mission Lost Sepulchros. Finally, there is simply no major argument that his participation in such an action would not be impossible for him. After all, it's worth recalling that some family OGs also took part in similar actions, such as the one in the drive-by mission. Therefore, Little Weasel's high position in the gang hierarchy neither proves anything here nor excludes it. Some people put the ballers from the alley in the role of the assassins during one of the scenes from the introduction. However, just by comparing the pedestrian models, we see that this cannot be true. Thanks in advance for all comments, ratings, and shares. Leave a sub if you like topics related to the GTA series, because soon there will be another video on the channel, and it would be nice if you didn't miss it. In the meantime, thank you all for watching, take care, and see you soon.